Hi, I'm Gareth Green and in this video we're going to have a little think about the Baroque Orchestra. What are the instruments in the Baroque Orchestra? What was the nature of the Baroque Orchestra? Because the orchestra as we know it today didn't really become a kind of standardised thing until the classical period. When we got to the classical period, we were kind of settled on this idea of, well, you've basically got a string section and then you've got your flutes, oboes, clarinets, bassoons in the wind section and you might have one player or two players. And then you've got your brass section, your trumpets and your horns. And then you've got your percussion, basically the timpani. And that became a sort of standardised orchestra in the classical period. So you're talking about that period from 1750 onwards and you're talking about composers like Haydn and Mozart. And Haydn, often known as the father of the symphony, he wrote 104 symphonies no less. And then as we went into the Romantic period, well, the orchestra started to expand in various ways. But nevertheless, even though the orchestra wasn't a standardised thing in the Baroque period, there's still plenty of Baroque music written loosely for orchestra. Now, there were huge variations in what orchestra meant in the Baroque because we hadn't yet reached that standardised place. So, different choices of instruments, different sizes of instrumental groups, different kind of playing styles, especially as we go around different parts of Europe and discover that different places were doing different things. So we've got everything in the Baroque orchestra from very small orchestras. Sometimes really they were so small that they were no more than chamber ensembles, you know, just one player per part a small group of instrumentalists working together. But then we had pieces which were designed for larger orchestras where you had several players per part. So you can see where all this is traveling that by the time we get to the classical period, we're all set to say, actually, this is kind of what works best. So we'll run with this from now on. Bach, going back to the Baroque, most famous Baroque composer. I mean, for example, he had an orchestra of 18 players when he was working in a place called Curtin. So it's a kind of standard orchestra size of 18 players. Quite a small orchestra, isn't it, in terms of what you might see in an orchestra these days. But we also know about certain other Baroque composers. Corelli, for example, he worked in Rome and he had an orchestra that actually was quite big. It varied in size between 35 players and 80 players. So that's very big on a Baroque scale to think that he might have had an orchestra with 80 players. And we're even told that on special occasions, Corelli was allowed to expand his orchestra to 150 players. Now that is a huge orchestra in the Baroque context. And 150 players to us sounds much more like a pretty large romantic period orchestra. So it might surprise you to know that in the Baroque, even though we haven't got this standardised thing, we may just have a handful of players working together and you might think, well, it's a bit more like a little sort of ensemble. Or you might have had Bach's sort of 18-piece orchestra. But here's Corelli with this larger orchestra, 35 to 80 players, sometimes going up to 150 players. Well, certainly those huge orchestras of Corelli were unusual. So don't think that that was at all normal in the Baroque because it certainly wasn't. Most Baroque orchestras were much smaller. So we've talked about a couple of Baroque composers there, haven't we? Corelli and Bach. But really the Baroque orchestra took shape in France. And it was really at the court of the French king where we have a composer called Lully. And Lully composed music and directed his own music that was played by a famous orchestra known as the 24 Violon du Roi, the 24 violins of the king. So that tells you something about the size of his orchestra. And 
Lully was quite happily writing for this orchestra, the 24 violins, but he soon kind of got hold of the idea that it was quite nice to colour that sound with other instruments, particularly wind instruments. So he added an instrument called the oboe, that's the French for oboe. And then he thought, well, what about transverse flutes? Transverse flutes, the flutes that we, we play side on. No, there was not recorders this way. So not recorders, but transverse flutes. So you get this idea that what he's up to, Lully, is saying, well, basically we've got this sort of 24 string player orchestra, and then we're going to color that with a bit of wind sound. Now, as well as the violins and these woodwind instruments, the Baroque orchestra also contained something called the basso continuo. Now, the basso continuo is something that's very important in the Baroque orchestra and Baroque music in general. So what have we got in a basso continuo? What is all that about? Well, it's basically a keyboard player, um, somebody who would typically play the harpsichord or the organ, the organ particularly if it was church music, and perhaps the harpsichord if it was non-church music, what we call secular music. Obviously, there are organs in churches and there aren't necessarily organs in other places, so that kind of follows, doesn't it? Um, so you had this keyboard player, but sometimes it might be somebody playing the lute, for example. So it might be a string instrument that would be involved in this. But basically somebody who's playing the bass line with the left hand and putting chords in the right hand. And the bass line was also doubled with another instrument. So frequently, if you had the harpsichord playing the continuo, you had a cello playing along with it. If you had the organ playing the continuo, well, you might have the cello playing along with it. You might have the bassoon playing along with it. So you get the idea, possibly a cello or a bassoon doubling the bass line. Because in Baroque thinking, there's a great deal going on that's about thinking from the bass line upwards, interestingly, because since the Baroque times, we've thought maybe much more from a kind of top line downwards. But they were really thinking from a bass line upwards. Then you had a kind of musical shorthand going on that the, the continuo player, the keyboard player typically, would have a bass line but no other notes. So what do they do? Just play the bass line? No, not at all. They had numbers underneath the notes called the figured bass and the numbers would tell the player which intervals they had to play above the bass. So let me give you an example. If you had C in the bass, you're in C major, and it said 5-3, you would say, what's five notes above C? Oh, that's G. What's three notes above C? Oh, that's E. And that would give you the chord. So you think, ah, it's a C, E, G chord, a C major chord. Now, the continuo player could then decide to play it like that, or could organize the notes in any other way. As long as they're using those notes some, in some arrangement in the right hand and sticking with that bass note in the left hand, that's how the numbers worked. And then you might have another bass note that says F, and then it might say 6-3. So you think, oh, what's 6 above F? That's D. What's 3 above F? That's A. Ah, so what have I got now? I've got a D minor chord in first inversion. In other words, a D minor chord, but the third of the chord F is in the bass. So I take my D, A, A, sorry, my F, A, D chord, my 6, 3 chord, and then I say, now I've got those notes, I can organize them in any way I want to, as long as I've still got that F in the bass line. So this is how a basso continuo worked. So the keyboard player could sort of improvise his or her own part, as long as it complied with these numbers and you had the bass line doubled with the cello or the bassoon. So in a sense, alongside that continuo, which was fundamental to the Brock Orchestra, but the continuo was the thing that gradually dropped out. So by the time we get into the classical period, we find the continuo disappearing and the orchestra managing quite happily without it but in the Brock, it was really kind of central. So alongside that basso continuo, and by the way, the conductor would often be the person playing the harpsichord in the middle of the ensemble, would play the harpsichord and conduct the orchestra at the same time. 
But alongside that continuo, we started to kind of develop these sections of the orchestra. So, you know, you've got your string section started to take shape, you know, the violins, violas, cellos, double basses, that all sounds quite familiar to us, doesn't it? And the woodwind, well, we got the idea that we basically had a string orchestra being kind of coloured by the woodwind, like Luddy was doing. So we had uh, recorders, we had flutes, they would have been wooden flutes then, oboes, bassoons, they start to appear in a woodwind section. We've got a brass section that starts to appear. So particularly the trumpets and the horns. What you have to remember about them, of course, is they didn't yet have valves. So they couldn't play every note of the scale. They could only play open notes of the harmonic series. So what's the harmonic series? Well, if you blow down a brass instrument not using any valves, well, the harmonic series is basically this. So you see what happens, the notes get closer together as you go up the harmonic series, but the further down you are, the wider apart those notes are and you can't play most of the notes. So sometimes you have these very virtuoso high parts like Bach, second Brandenburg concerto, high trumpets. And the reason they're so high is so that you can play neighboring notes. So you have a very high virtuoso trumpet part up there. Um, so brass are sometimes used either in that sort of virtuoso high register or just used a bit occasionally further down when they could play notes that fitted. But the brass weren't fully liberated yet because they didn't have their valves. You had timpani, otherwise known to us as kettle drums. And so you had this orchestra that kind of built around the strings, but also built around the continuo about the, the keyboard player. So if we want to just get into the detail though of what these Baroque instruments were, I've tried to put some of them on the board because the thing that strikes you when you look at that list is that there are all sorts of instruments on there that we know about, and then there are other instruments where you think, what, I've never heard of one of those. So one thing that also becomes obvious when we look at the detail of Baroque instruments that might be used in the orchestra is that, of course, these instruments had to be kind of developed and then they had to be kind of standardised in some way. So some of them kind of died out. Others were kind of developed, so they became particularly useful in the orchestra. And so we gradually moved into a shape of instruments that would work from the classical period onwards. In the Baroque period, we've still got many instruments that are under development, if you like. So, you know, you'll look at that list and you'll recognise a lot of things like violin and viola and cello. You know, the violone was a kind of bass instrument, but things like the tenor violin, that's a funny thing, isn't it? And do we need a tenor violin in the long term? If we've got a viola and a cello, we probably don't. So it kind of fizzles out a bit. Uh, the violino piccolo, the high violin. Well, eventually the violin developed in such a way that it could encompass those high notes. So we didn't kind of need it. You know, the bass violin. Well, do we need a bass violin when we've got a contrabass or a you know, double bass? The lute we've talked about, a kind of string instrument, not completely unlike the guitar, but it's got a great big kind of ball shaped thing on it, different kind of sound. Uh, the theorbo, goodness me, the arch lute, the mandora, the bandora, the mandolin, you might have heard of that. You know, what are all these things? We've heard of guitars and harps, but some of these things have just kind of fizzled out and we don't see them again, do we? In the woodwind section, well, Baroque flute. Okay, well, we know about the flute and uh, the Baroque flute was a rather charming instrument. So composers used it a lot and then the flute developed thereafter because in the Baroque, it was a wooden instrument. And then we got into, oh, we could have metal flutes later. You know, things like the, the shalomo. Well, we call the bottom register of the clarinet these days, the shalomo register. And the clarinet was a kind of late developer, you know, it wasn't used in the Baroque orchestra particularly, but becomes a very important thing in the classical period, you know. So you see, there's an instrument that's still under development. Baroque oboe, you know, it doesn't sound like a modern oboe, but it's on its way to that, it becomes a, but what about the musette de corps and the cortole and the dulcian, you know, funny things. This is a lovely one called a racket. <laughs> 
Well, there are plenty of people who make a racket on a musical instrument, aren't there? But this was an official racket, uh, a proper instrument of its own. We've heard of the recorder and the bassoon. The brass instruments, well, you know, Baroque trumpet, yeah, we get the idea. Uh, no vowels, it's going to develop into a more modern trumpet, the natural horn, called the natural horn, because again, it doesn't have valves. Later on, it's going to get its valves. But we've got these other funny things, haven't we? The serpent, the sack butt. Oh, they're fun, aren't they? The cornet. Well, we kind of recognise the cornet because it plays in brass bands these days. But the cornet, slightly different kind of instrument back then. So, you know, a whole range of instruments there. The keyboard instrument. We've, we've talked about the harpsichord and the organ. The forte piano is starting to be developed. Like the tangent piano. I mean, these, these are in the early stages of development. The clavichord, another very kind of soft keyboard instrument people often use for practicing actually because of that. The percussion section, well the timpani, we know about them, the tambourine, the castanet, we've come, come across them haven't they? But again they're still instruments that had to be developed. So it's quite interesting just to see the kind of range of Baroque instruments and if you're really into this you might want to look at that list and see if you can find some recordings of these less usual instruments so you kind of get to grips with some of these baroque sounds it's a very interesting thing to do actually if you're into baroque music at all just to have a think about the instrument that you play and think what did that instrument sound like in the baroque if you play the piano your piano doesn't sound anything like a baroque keyboard instrument so it's quite handy to think well if i'm playing a piece on the piano that maybe was written for the harpsichord what did the harpsichord sound like you know, if you're playing the flute, well, what did this wooden Baroque flute sound like? Because it's a very different kind of sound and it helps you to understand much more about the style of the music and the ways in which you might interpret the music. So it's all quite interesting. But you can see the point here that the Baroque orchestra, I'm not saying it was a kind of musical mistake. What I am saying is that they got the notion of putting instrumentalists together in anything from a small ensemble to something as big as Corelli's huge 150 piece orchestra for special occasions. But it was a kind of kind of throwing these instruments into the mix to see what worked for a particular piece on a particular occasion. And you've got all these instruments to choose from that are still being developed. And then when we get to the end of the Baroque period and we get to the classical period, that's the moment at which they say, well, okay, actually we're really quite interested in this thing we're calling the orchestra. Let's decide what it's gonna be. Let's standardize the orchestra. And that was really the start of the, the orchestra as we know it today. But this is just a little insight into what the possibilities were in the Baroque Orchestra. So I hope that's a helpful introduction to the Baroque Orchestra. And do go away and listen to music played on authentic Baroque instruments and see if you can flush out a few things on this list. And you'll really enjoy listening to the sound of those Baroque instruments and those Baroque ensembles that make up the Baroque Orchestra. Well, if you've enjoyed this video, let me invite you to go to the Music Matters website, www.mmcourses.co.uk. There are so many things on there that could well be useful to you. We've got courses. So if you go to the homepage, click on courses, that will show you all the courses we've got. We've got things covering theory, harmony, composition, dealing with oral tests, learning the art of oral dictation, learning how to do keyboard harmony, learning how to analyze music, compose in different styles. There are so many different things there that are all designed to resource musicians. So do have a look at that. And also while you're on the homepage, click on Maestros. That's our international community of musicians. And all sorts of perks come with being a member of Maestros. And there are three different levels, nothing to do with ability, um, but about how far you want to go with it. But as you go up the levels, there are more and more benefits. By the time you get to level two, for example, you can join us for a monthly live stream where I 
put in an hours of sol solid teaching and there's a live chat running. You can ask your questions, make comments. Uh, if you go to level three, you get access to two live streams a month. And the second one is a place where you can send in your own compositions or your own recorded performances. And I'll give you some one-to-one -one feedback on that. And we'll share that within the group so we can all learn from each other. And lovely group of people uh, who always tell me they can't wait for the next live stream to get together with their musical friends from across the world and to learn from each other. So have a look and see what you can find that might be useful to you. www.mmcourses.co.uk